I'll be brief. Um, under 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> um, in, uh, I'm going to talk about Article 10, this new state siting law uh, that now governs uh, wind farms or wind turbine projects greater than 25 megawatts uh, by design. Um, in the Article 10 proceedings, the concerns that have been identified by Director Stapleton, Dr. Punch, and Mr. Rand have largely fallen through the cracks. This is principally because starting with the first uh, Article 10 decision, the Casadega Wind Project, the siting board has elected to rely on averaging metrics for noise, such as a one hour average equivalent noise level or worse, an annual average sound level limit. As uh, Dr. Punch pointed out, nobody hears an average sound level. And as uh, Mr. Rand has shown with these graphics, the pulsations in wind turbine noise uh, typically range between five and 10 uh, decibels. So you can have uh, as much as five decibels above the average and five decibels below the average, and that happens about once every second, because as the blade, and this uh, coincides with the blade passing frequency as the blades turn. Um, and you saw the one slide um, Mr. Rand showed where the highest level of noise is on one side of that circle. So every time it passes that area, you get a pulse. And if you're going to try to regulate noise with an average noise level, you're not being realistic because people don't hear that. It's not a constant hum. This is uh, also uh, reminds me of the misinformation that you get from the wind industry. They say, well, these turbines aren't any louder than a refrigerator. That's true. The refrigerator is going to be about 35, 40, 45 decibels at a steady hum. Uh, but I don't know about you, but I don't sleep at night with a refrigerator by my side. And the refrigerator is in a broadband sound, and we've been talking about low frequency sound. It's not the same. It's between 500 and 4,000 hertz, which is the portion of the frequency bands that uh, we hear the best. Um, those kinds of sounds are dampened by the walls. So when I go to bed at night, there's a wall or two between me and my refrigerator. Uh, when you're getting 40 decibels of wind turbine noise, that's coming from 1,000 to 3,000 feet away. It's already passed through your walls and windows. It's not going to stop at the next wall. It's going to continue. And so that level of noise is going to get in your bedroom. And to its credit, the uh, State Siting Board in the Casadega decision uh, rejected the applicant's claim that low frequency noise wouldn't reach into the house. It would be dampened by 15 decibels by the walls. Um, they said it's not dampened by that much. And even if it is dampened by a few decibels, the structural elements of the home, according to the Siting Board decision, act as a resonator magnifying the sound inside. That's not what a refrigerator does. But the board continues to use these averaging noise metrics. And you know we're trying to get them uh, in the Alley Cat case, where I'm representing you know, several citizens groups, uh, to uh, adjudicate the issue of uh, whether that's true or not, and whether they should instead be looking at the noise events that occur during the night. That's what the World Health Organization says you must do to protect health. Uh, and as I just indicated, you're getting a noise event every second in the pulsations from wind turbine noise. And if 10 events is enough to create chronic sleeplessness and cause adverse health effects, then wind turbine noise is, can be anticipated to do that too. So I don't have a lot of optimism in the Article 10 process. A better source of optimism is in the exercise of home rule by towns in New York. Article 10 supports the exercise of home rule by requiring the siting board 
to apply local laws regulating large-scale wind energy projects. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this because Article 10 preempts town permitting. But Article 10 says what's preempted are procedural rules. So the town's ability to go through a permitting procedure is preempted because Article 10 does that. But Article 10 doesn't have any standards. Article 10 says only at the end of the process, we're gonna review the application, the parties are gonna go through discovery, ask each other questions about where they get their facts, there's gonna be an evidentiary hearing at which we test the opinions of their experts and we're trying to get down to the truth. Um, but in the end, Article 10 says, in order to give this project a certificate, the siting board must find that the impacts have been reduced to the maximum extent practicable. Practicable for who? The project sponsor. So it's very unlikely that anybody will ever win under Article 10, except if Article 10 has to be applied in a town that has adopted a 35 decibel noise limit. Then the article, the siting board must apply that because there aren't any standards like that in Article 10, but there's a rule in Article 10 that says you must apply the substantive standards of the local law in the town where the project's located. I've drafted a number of uh, wind laws for towns. I've reviewed wind laws for towns. It is very easy to draft a wind law that is reasonable and protective of public health. Um, if a wind farm, a wind project sponsor doesn't want to come around because you've drafted a law that protects your people from adverse health effects, isn't that a good thing? In the uh, number three wind project, an interrogatory or discovery question was asked, how much um, energy, how much uh, carbon emissions in New York will your project reduce? And they have a program that they run for this. And it's a tolerably decent program. It takes into account uh, the fact that you have to have backup gas-fired power plants to run wind farms when the wind stops blowing. It takes into account, to some degree, the fact that there will be a lot of other wind projects on the system. So if you reduce the amount of electricity needed, you're actually reducing very low emissions electricity if you have a lot of wind farms on the system. And here in New York, we have an upstate grid that's separated from the downstate grid, and the grid operator says the upstate grid operates pretty much independently, and you're already getting 90% of your electricity from zero emissions sources. That's from nuclear, hydropower from Niagara Falls, uh, and 2% from wind. So you can't wring much more carbon out of the system because the carbon intensity of the electrical power plant system is so low. And the ISO has also said, if you keep putting more wind farms on the system with this bottled upstate grid, uh, not, uh, not doing anything about it, not building a new bulk transmission line to New York City to get the electricity where it's needed, that's not happening. There's no plan to do that. It may be decades before we ever see that. If you keep doing that, the grid operator says, you're going to have to tell other wind farms to shut down more and more. So the more wind farms you have, the more you have to tell the other wind farms to slow down when the wind comes up in the whole region and there's a huge surge, the system can't handle it. They have to call up other wind farms, even Niagara Falls has to be called up and, and told to ground out their power because the transmission system can't handle that. At the same time, the transmission system is not taking any of the electricity downstate. So there are all these problems with the transmission system that nobody seems to be paying any attention to, and we keep building more wind farms. The taller uh, the turbines are, the more noise they make. The turbines in Sheldon uh, in western New York are 420 feet high. The ones they want to put up in Farmersville, Freedom, Rushford um, uh, for the Alley Cat project are 598 feet high. In the town of Guilford, New York, 
in uh, eastern New York, Calpine wants to put up 676 foot high turbines. In all of those towns, the wind project sponsor went to the town early before the Article 10 process ever got off the ground and said, we need a local law that increases the allowable height of turbines to what we need, 598 feet, 676 feet. They're gonna get even bigger. There's no reason that a local town cannot put a 400 foot limit or even lower on wind turbines. You can be in favor of renewable energy, in favor of wind energy, and allow uh, wind uh, facilities or, or wind turbines on farms, on uh, private property that are smaller. That technology is available. Article 10 says um, a local uh, law provision will be waived, potentially, um, if it's unreasonably burdensome in light of the technology. Well, it's not burdensome to go get smaller turbines. It may not be your business model, but it's not unreasonably burdensome. So I believe, and I'm pretty confident, that a town that adopts a 400 foot uh, allowable height limit on wind turbines, uh, that law must be and will be applied in Article 10. A town that adopts a 35 decibel uh, sound level limit, which is uh, on, the, on the threshold of health, that will be applied because that's reasonable. It's got a scientific health-based basis. So the best source of optimism for people looking to preserve the character of their rural communities is to get their local town to do some homework and to pass a proper wind law. Thanks. <laughs>